And so now we have moving to the more technical side of uh, the Super Bowl itself. And I'm pleased to be joined by a legendary American football coach who's the director of player development at the University of Hawaii. And he was also a former special teams coordinator for the Montreal Alouettes and the Hamilton <laughs> Tiger Cats. But you are more familiar with him as an analyst on Sky Sports NFL coverage. It's Coach Jeff Reinbold. Thank you very much for coming back and doing this for a third year in a row. How are you, my friend? I'm great, Murph. I just want you to uh, we're introducing a new type of technology today. It's called okay. the bubble. It's called the bobble cam. So if this thing bobbles and <laughs> moves all over the joint, it's just because, it's you know, we're trying to refine a really high end new technology. All right. I love it. Is, is this like one of those interactive X's and O's cameras? So it makes you feel like you're part of the play. This is what we're trying to do here. Well, I I can't give away all the secrets technologically and because it's so high tech, I, I don't even know it all. Right. There's a, we have a guy that works in uh, Manchuria that comes and, you know, is our technical advisor. So this is his project. So again, I, I'm sworn to secrecy. <laughs> well, hopefully you can come back in a few months time and tell us how successful the project <laughs> has been and let us know for sure um uh, as always it's great to have you on we're going to talk a little bit uh x's and o's here i know you still got a lot of prep to do before the game we are recording this about nine ten days before the game so appreciate things are always likely to change but just before we get into that what do you make of this matchup of the chiefs and the eagles do you feel this was as good a matchup we were going to get based on the teams that made the playoffs or was there uh, maybe another romantic angle you were angling for or a better matchup in your eyes, or, or do you think this is as good as it was going to get? No, I thought that going into the last two months of the season, which in, when at that point you can really, I think, start to give an educated guess to who's going to make the Super Bowl. I picked Kansas City and San Francisco to be in the Super Bowl and San Francisco mm -hmm. to win the game because I thought they had a more complete roster. Obviously, when Purdy went down last week, that was the end of, you know, San Francisco. And it was, you know, that was really hard to watch because, you know, you see guys that have played Bosa, Greenwell, Warner. I mean, you know, they're just great football players and they, they never had a chance, you know, and that's mm. that's unfair. But that's just the way the game is not to take anything away from Philadelphia because Philadelphia did what they had to do to win the game. Uh, now. Kansas City, on the other hand, kind of limped into the Super Bowl. You know, Patrick's ankle, his high ankle sprain, which, you know, Murph, if you've ever had one of those things, they are mm. extremely painful and they're very, very slow to heal. So what he was able to do on a week is incredible, you know, to go out and play at the level he played at. Now he's going to have another week. But I'm more concerned with where they are with receivers right now because, mm. you know, they lost some really good players the three of their top receivers went out in the game they were playing with sky Moore and and uh, marcus kemp at the end of the game and two tight ends what has nobody has talked about is the coaching aspect of it and what i saw in the playoffs was andy reed do an amazing job of adjusting during the course of a game to things that you don't think you're going to have to adjust to you don't count on your starting quarterback getting a high ankle sprain and be one legged and you have to go out and win a game. You don't count on losing three receivers, you know, in one game and you with a beat up quarterback. So he, he adjusted over the course of the game better than I think I've ever seen any coach adjust. I mean, at the end of the game, they're playing Kelsey in the backup tight end and two wideouts that are on the, you know, we're practice roster guys, you know, and, they came in and they played well enough to win the football game. Now, how much can they heal? That's one factor because Philadelphia is physical and they mm. will pound you. And I think if Kansas City's not up to that, then it's going to be a it's going to be a tough afternoon in, you know, in Phoenix for Kansas City. When I look at the Eagles, I look at a team that I think has got a lot of confidence, got a lot of veteran players, got a great roster. Can Kansas City hold up to the onslaught up front? And can they force, you know, Jalen Hurts to play from behind on the sticks where he's not really comfortable? Get him to third and eight. Get him to second and tens. 
where he's got to drop back and throw from the pocket and you take the RPO game away from him, the sprint game and some of the other things that he does, then I think Kansas City have a chance. If they're able to run the ball effectively, particularly on first and second down, it's going to be tough for Kansas City. Yeah, I agree with that. I think as well, when it comes to those longer yardage situations, because the one thing about Philadelphia, I have a big question mark over, and you can fill me in a little bit. At the end of the regular season, Jalen Hurts didn't play. He's got this shoulder injury. It's on his throwing arm. We know he took the time for that. They're in a position where he could do that anyway. And in the playoffs, they haven't really been tested. They played a Giants team who <clears throat> ran out of gas. Um, I don't can't think of a better reason, but they just didn't show up uh, against the Eagles. And then you we already explained the situation with Brock Purdy, and you were down to to Josh Johnson. And no disrespect to Josh Johnson, but he's not unfortunately seasoned and proven enough to lead a team um, in in a, in a situation like he was thrown into. And it obviously, it's a difficult situation, regardless. But uh, with where they're at, so they never really require Jalen Hurts to throw the ball as much as he probably will need to in the Super Bowl. Do you feel that with that, have you seen anything from the last couple of games that suggests that that shoulder's healing and he, he should be okay? Or do you will you still hold some reservations about his injury going into this game? Well, I'm not as concerned about his injury as I am about his history, right? Okay. And, and when I say that, I, that is not a knock against the player, right? No. What I think... Sirianni has done an outstanding job with in Philadelphia is he's tailored an offense to fit the strengths of his quarterback, not tried to fit the strength of his quarterback into his offense. And that is, I think the, that's why these young offensive coaches in the NFL today are starting to get a leg up and starting to get jobs and all of those things because they're morphing the college game into the NFL game. Because think about it. Nobody gets three years to win now. You either win right now or they find another guy. And mm. so, and that's for players and coaches that, you know, when I'm talking about quarterbacks. So you, you don't have, there's no developmental period, right? The college game and the NFL game traditionally have been historically very different. So what these young coaches with college backgrounds have started to do is bring some of the college offense to their quarterback so that he's more comfortable and can play at a high level faster, right? Yeah. Now, when he has to go back and take a snap, you know, drop back, make a full field read, all of that, the jury's out right now, right? Especially under pressure in the biggest game. So I'm not, and again, I love Jalen Hurts, but I'm just saying mm. that he hasn't done that yet. Jordan Mailata is a mauler at left tackle as a run blocker. He's an outstanding run blocker. But where you can get him is in his pass protection. So if if Jordan Mailata, just like Jalen Hurts, is facing a lot of third and eights, third and tens, he, it's going to be a it's going to be a tough day for him because Spags has shown like last week it was genius, Murph. I mean that's not genius. Genius is split the atoms and you know cure cancer mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Good football coaches figure out how to use their personnel well. Well, they all of a sudden sacked Joe Burrow three times real quick in the game because he went to a system that he'd not played before. He went to Chris Jones and three defensive ends on the field. Okay? So he got all of his best pass rushers on the field as soon as it got to be a long down and distance situation, which I think you'll see the same if he can get – Philadelphia in those downs down and distances if the Chiefs get up early and force the Philadelphia Eagles out of the run game then it's going to be a different story if Philadelphia has their way and they want to turn it Philadelphia would love nothing more to turn this into a backyard brawl and say we're going to run the ball 40 times mm -hmm. against you if that happens Philadelphia will win the game right now that's where, you know, all of these next nine days is going to be so important, you know, in how this game unfolds. Yeah, it's amazing insight. And I think uh, the one thing I, I, like I said, I worry about, because when you look at the personnel matchups, especially on, on offense, you would give the advantage to, ironically, the Eagles. They've got 
the better running backs who have been more consistent throughout the season and have continued to put up not just good yards per carry, but good yards after contact. Then you've got Jalen Hurts, who himself is mobile and has put up very decent rushing numbers himself. Then you've also got the wide receivers and AJ Brown and Devonta Smith, who trump anything really that the the offense of the Chiefs can offer, especially with all of these injuries. And yet, somehow, we always feel that they're at a disadvantage on offense, despite all of this, because they've got to deal with Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey, and then the legend that is Andy Reid. So, what can the Eagles try and do to bring the game in the, in their way and be able to make it that back, you know, that that backyard brawl and and control the the tempo of the game? How are they going to stop Andy Reid and and stop? Patrick Mahomes and and exploit maybe some weaknesses on that side of the ball? Well, I think the first thing they're going to have to do is they're going to have to own the line of scrimmage. Now, one of the things that creates an advantage for the Eagles is they live in 11 personnel. And that when we say 11 personnel, that's one back, one tight end, Mm -hmm. and three wide receivers. And most teams, and Kansas City is one of the teams that does it, when you go to 11 personnel, they immediately go to nickel defense, which is four down linemen, They take out a linebacker and put in another defensive back and play with two linebackers. So you're playing with what we call a light box. Normally you want seven in the box. Now they're going to have six in the box. That gives Philadelphia an advantage because when you have to defend the quarterback, and this is really important for the fans to understand this, when you have to defend the quarterback in the run game, you create an extra gap that the defense has to defend, and there's nobody for that gap. So what Sirianni has been able to do by using personnel is create a numbers advantage on the line of scrimmage. One of the reasons they block, they run the ball so well. Now they're great blockers. I'm not taking anything away from them. I want, I want to make that perfectly clear, but I watched against San Francisco where Greenwell and Warner who are sideline to sideline linebackers, all of a sudden they have to come up into the line of scrimmage and take on big bodies. And, you know, and and you look at the lot of those runs that Philadelphia had against San Francisco, they weren't on the edge. They were between the tackles. They were up inside where, whether it was Kelsey on a C block where he steps around the guard and and goes up to the linebacker or in a pure zone system where they double the two defense down linemen and climb to the linebacker. There were a lot of times that Philadelphia's backs, didn't get touched until they were at the second level. And when you can do that, you know, you're, you're doing well. How much can Kansas city counter that? What's their answer going to be? I think one of the things you're going to see is Kansas city is going to say, okay, we're going to put the pressure on our corners. We're going to play press man to man, right? Take away all the easy throws, the slants and the RPO throws and play another player in the box and, be aggressive because we have to create, we have to get the numbers back on our side. But if they play a too high shell and play nickel defense, Philadelphia will rip them. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's amazing insight because as a fan, you're, you're still picking up the X's are you're still trying to see the, the weaknesses, but obviously we're dealing with two experienced, um, defensive coordinators who are studying the game, especially someone like Steve Spagnola and, uh, and Jonathan Gannon, you know, these guys uh, understand how to, you know, take advantage. Although this is Jonathan Gannon's, I think first Super Bowl appearance, he's still experienced and seasoned enough to be able to see, you know, these advantages. Do you think here that with the talent that the Eagles have managed to amass on, on defense, that they are going to, be able to run over the offensive line and, and force Patrick Mahomes into those scrambles that might affect his ankle and his throwing motion? Or do you feel that the containment approach will be the better approach uh, for them to maybe let Kelsey get his yards over the middle um, and then not give up the big play and then force the pressure when they're sort of around field goal range through to uh, goal to go? Or do you feel that they're just better off setting the tone early, being aggressive early, as they kind of have been in many of these games recently, and trying to stick to that. What what would you do in this situation? I think what you're going to see is, you know, again, like as they do their work, which they're doing right now, they're going to look at, you know, 
hours and hours and hours of game tape, right? And they're going to look for any kind of advantage that they can create, any weakness that they can see on Kansas City side of the football. So right now, where I'd say you have a chance, right, is Andrew Wiley at right guard, right tackle for Kansas City. That would be the guy that I would attack. And I would put my best pass rusher. And I think it was really interesting. All of a sudden, last week, instead of being the right defensive end, Hassan Reddick comes over and plays left defensive end. Why? Because Jonathan Gannon knew that the matchup he wanted was his best pass rusher, all right, against who? Mike McGlinchey, who's the second best tackle at San Francisco. Right. Don't waste him against, you know, Trent Williams, get him over where he can get wins for you. And where did Purdy get hurt from Hassan Reddick coming off the left side? The same thing's true. Hassan Reddick coming off the left side when he sacked Josh Johnson and knocked the ball out. That should have been, that should have been a, a fumble return. Now the reality of those plays, if you look a little closer is there were, scheme flaws within San Francisco, but you could see what Jonathan Gannon was doing. He was matching his guys against guys. So again, I would not be surprised to see Hassan Reddick line up on the right side and pass, you know, rushdowns this week and see if they can get him against Jordan Mailata because Lane Johnson has not given up a sack at right tackle the entire season, not one. So don't waste your best rusher against him. You know, put your second best rusher there and now go to work on the guy that you know you might have a chance to win with. And put yourself in best opportunities to win. I, I... That's co- hey, You know, in Murph, that's coaching. That's what the best coaches do. And I, and I, sometimes I, I, you know, like I look at movies like Any Given Sunday and, you know, uh, you know, t- the, the Titans and all that. Stuff. And that's, that's all coaching. That's, you know, right. I get it. Right. But the really high level coaching that goes on in pro football, it's about matching your players up, mitigating their the things that they don't do well and finding ways to give them an opportunity to do the things that they do well. Hassan Reddick was a first round pick, the 13th player picked in the draft, and they couldn't figure out in with the Cardinals what to do with him because they were trying to make him be something that he wasn't right. He's a incredible pass rusher. He's a game record kind of player, but he's not a true outside linebacker, right? Which is what they yeah. drafted him to be. So it took him going to Philadelphia really to be in a system where they don't ask him to drop into coverage. They don't ask him to do a whole bunch of things. They give him a job and say, hey, listen, go make that quarterback's life miserable for 60 minutes. And he has he, – Murph, he has now six forced fumbles on the season. Number one I mean, in the league. Yeah. And also double-digit sacks again did that last season. You know, he's proving his ultimate value right now. Wouldn't be uh, right for me to let you go without talking about the special teams battle here. These are mm-hmm. two well-coached special teams um, outfits. Would you state that there's one that's potentially better than the other um, in terms of personnel? And I mean, it's a big loss for the Chiefs to lose Mc- uh, Nicole Hardman, uh, who won't be playing in the game, it looks like. So they're going to have to change returner. But even with that change, is, is there a preference that you would have? Or do you think there's there's a big difference in between these special teams units? Well, I, I think that that one of the things that won the game for him, if you will, right? Because everybody points to, you know, Osai's last play and all that stuff, which is that, that's the low-hanging fruit. But if yeah. you look what really won, in, in my opinion, for Kansas City was the reemergence of the Kansas City special teams because they were the last – they do a thing called special teams efficiency grade, right? It's all of the factors in special teams, field position gain, field position loss, return touchdowns, field goal percentage, every, every statistical category. It's like 14 items. And then they, they rank every team in the National Football League. Dave Tobe is one of the best special teams coaches in the league. However, 
this year, the Kansas City Chiefs special teams were 32nd out of 32 wow. teams, right? But well, why is that? Well, they got a lot of rookies playing. He doesn't – I mean, the roster's not built to be great on special teams. They lost some veteran players that were all good special teams players in the past. So it's been a long year for them. Sky Moore goes back in the game as the backup punt returner because they tried to make a punt returner out of him early in the year, and he's muffed about three punts. Yeah, he did. And at a time when they need a huge return, he gets them a huge return because if he doesn't make that return, and this is like – it frustrates me as a special teams coach because the freaking analysts don't even get it, right? No. But if he doesn't make that long return, even if Osai has the penalty, they're not going to kick the field goal, right? The field position that he gained on that play was huge. I mean, absolutely huge. And so it may be one of those kinds of plays that special teams – become the turning point for either of these teams. Now, Philadelphia is better than Cincinnati on special teams, in my opinion. So I think it's going to be interesting to watch who goes back to return punts first. Is it, are they going to, you know, Sky Moore's the, got the hot hand. Is he going to go back and be the punt returner? We'll see be, because he didn't go into the game to be the first punt returner. He, he was the backup, right? Yeah. So, Again, that, there's a lot of factors at play here, and this is the this is the biggest stage, man. This is where all the chips are shoved into the middle of the table, and we got one hand to play. We got 60 minutes of cards to play, and it's gonna be it's high stakes poker at its best. Oh, 100. percent And this is why we love it, right? So the question, and this has been a theme throughout this show, is. The Chiefs are now at the third Super Bowl in four years. Yes, granted, the one in Tampa was bizarre because of the lockdown and less media responsibilities, but still, it was they still coached the big game in a stadium with fans, granted, not full. The Eagles, of course, were there five years ago. Different coaching staff, different personnel. Yes, there's a few holdovers on this roster, but it's very few and far between. In, if the game is close and it's down to those crucial moments, do you think the experience of Andy Reid, Patrick Mahomes, of being in their third Super Bowl in four years, gives them advantage over Nick Sirianni and Jalen Hurts because they'll have the know-how of being in the situation of being in these tough places, whether it's maybe Sirianni and, hey, and Jalen Hurts don't? Or do we feel we're just looking a little bit too much into that? Well, I think it's, I think it's going to be interesting to see how Sirianni and his staff handle it when it doesn't go well for them. Because if you look at it, the two games that they've played in the playoffs have really been walks in the park yeah. because they're so much better than the Giants. And the Giants had a great year, and Brian Dable did a great job. And But, but they're a team that's on the rise, not a team that's ready to win a Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And then they go out the next week, and the sixth play of the game, the other quarterback goes down, and you go to a guy who's been on 14 NFL teams and hasn't thrown a pass all year. Not fair, right? No matter how good the defense is, right? And then you lose him, and now you don't even have the quarterback. You got, you know, your your tailback takes his gloves off and lines up and plays court. That's not a fair fight. So he's had it his way the whole time. What I want to see is how do they re all react if Kansas City jumps up on them 14-0, which, which can happen with Kansas City, right? Mm -hmm. Or if Hurts doesn't play well, or if Hurts goes down, how are they going to, you know, what are, how are they going to respond? I don't have that same question with Andy Reid because we've seen him do it time and time again. He's more battle tested right now. Doesn't mean he's better. It just mm. means he's more battle tested. So if it comes down to that, logic would tell you go with the battle tested guy. Yeah, I, th I, I agree. We've seen so many scenarios where coaches who haven't been under pressure, I immediately go back to, um, Matt LaFleur in the NFC Championship game a couple of years ago against Tampa Bay and Tom Brady, and they opt to kick a field goal and give the ball back to Tom Brady as opposed to trying to go for the touchdown that would put them ahead in the game because they felt, well, you know, at the end of the day, we need to, we needed the score. Um, it still gives us a chance. If we're, we've got all our timeouts, we keep the D. Uh, if we get a stop here, we'll have a chance to try and win the game. And obviously that didn't happen. Tom Brady saw out the clock and it was a mind-boggling decision. And it was pressure, wasn't it? He didn't have time. 
to process that fast enough. And it'll be interesting because Nick Sirianni hasn't faced that pressure this year. Is he going to make a mistake that could potentially cost his team? That's why I asked the question. We know Andy Murph, won't. It's a, Murph, it's a great question. It's a valid question because I asked Coach Vermeil that. And he said, you can't understand. You can call all the guys you want. And I'm sure Nick Sirianni's called everybody that he knows who's been to a Super Bowl looking for advice on how to prepare and all that other stuff. Because it's not just the 60 minutes of the game. It's the two weeks leading up to the game. How you deal with the media. How you prepare your team. How Are you going to have curfew? Are you going to have bed check? Or what do you, when do the wives come? How do you distribute tickets? I mean, it's, an, it's like an unbelievable circus mm-hmm. that you have to manage. Right. If you've never been, if the only time you've been to the surf- circus is when you bought a ticket and now they're asking you to be the ringmaster, that's a pretty <laughs> tall order, dude. I'm telling that's you. Right. Oh, so, so like, that's why I think the chiefs have, have an advantage because they've got a veteran staff that's been there, done it. Right. Yeah. They've got a quarterback that's been there, done it right. All their best players. Um, now again, that's, that's just a chance for them to have a great, a better experience, right? Doesn't mean they're gonna, you know, no. look at, I think it's so what you said started my brain to work. And it was like, yeah, think about Sean McVay when he went and played for his first one and he couldn't adjust. He didn't know what the, he froze in, in the, and he'd tell you that. Yeah. He said, I didn't prepare him well. And I didn't, didn't adjust in the game. Think about Dan Quinn when yeah. he, he'd probably still be the head coach in, in Atlanta right now. If he'd have told his offensive coordinator on third and two late in the game, when all you got to do is get another first down to win the game and you call a pass and a guy misses a a pass protection, your quarterback gets sacked, the ball fumbled, and now you lose the Super Bowl, right? Yeah. So would Dan Quinn now take a different approach? Yeah. I would would think so. But he he may never get a second chance, right? Coach Vermeil. He wore the Philadelphia Eagles out, wore them out, full pad practices, bed check every night for two weeks before they went to play the Raiders, and the Raiders blew them out of the stadium. And the Raiders players were on Bourbon Street every night, right? They were just loose. They were just relaxed and ready to go. so, So, again, when Coach went back a second time and he took the Rams back there, they beat the Titans by a yard and a half. Right. But that's he learned. Now, again, that's where I think the advantage is definitely with Kansas City. Yeah. And I mean, for me as well, I think back to two years ago with Andy Reid and and it for him, he will feel disappointed about that game. I feel he'll have something to prove. Patrick Mahomes will have something to prove. But also don't forget they face their own challenges uh, that time around with what was going on with Andy Reid's son and, and the car accident, you know. We didn't, we didn't really factor that into our thinking with the game. The Chiefs went in heavy favourites, but that clearly had an impact on that coaching staff on that team. So it's and the Chiefs have got uh, the Eagles have got their own situation right now. They've got a player who's just been indicted. All of those sorts of things are things that Nick Sirianni, again, as we say, have not had to deal with. And it's whoever I feel looks after and deals with those situations that are going to come up over the next ten days. Regardless of the person on the field, I feel will make could make the difference if this game is a close one. If it's a, it's a blowout, it won't. But well, yeah. you know, you don't you don't wish this on anybody. But over the course of Super Bowl history, there have been more than one or two examples of, you know, the the Falcons are playing. I think it was the Packers in the or De- maybe it was Denver in the Super Bowl in Miami, and their Pro Bowl safety, right who had just won the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award for 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 uh, for the Falcons. Charity work and, and yeah. everything that they've done. And, Goes yeah. out and solicits a prostitute and gets arrested. Okay? Okay? Now, the Cincinnati Bengals had a running back have a drug overdose the night before the game. Right? The and Oakland Raiders are going to the Super Bowl and their Pro Bowl center – they're in California, and their Pro Bowl center goes to Tijuana, and they can't find him for the game. So these things have happened over the course. These next two weeks, there's no guarantees, baby. No. <laughs> so, you, you know, who manages all of this the best? And then who coaches the best those 60 minutes? 
Yeah, it's going to be a great game. I cannot wait for it. I'm going to push you for a prediction. Who do you think is lifting the Lombardi uh, in nine days' time? I'm going to say I'm going to say the Kansas City Chiefs because you know again until you get a chance to uh, prove to me that they're not, I'm I'm saying that all of their players are healthy, right? Mm-hmm. Now, if they're not healthy, it's a different dog, right? Of course. But to me, I'm always going to go for experienced coaching and experienced quarterback play. Yeah, I'm with you on that. That's my prediction all the way through as well. Um, until I hear something otherwise that's going to make me swing, I'm with you. But thank you so much. Is there anything you want to plug? Or uh, obviously, you've got the show that you'll be doing. Can you share with us any guests that you'll have on on uh, Sky NFL on, on Super Bowl Sunday? We're going to have a loaded group of guests all during the week from Radio, Radio Row. Uh, we'll do a show every day. Uh, Christian Wilkins is joining us on game day. Uh, the the legend that is Ryan Fat- Fitzpatrick will be there. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I think it's going to be a great, great presentation by Sky. Great way to end, this, end the season. Um, stay with us at the Jeff Reinbold Show uh, every week during the off season. We're going to continue to expand that and, and – uh, you know, podcasts and all the things we do leading up to the draft. So there is no off season for us, Murph. We don't do, we don't play that game. Off season's where it all comes alive. This is when the real work is done. I love it. I love it. Uh, uh, Well, look, coach, thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, Good luck Sunday. Um, Looking forward to tuning in and and watching you uh, dazzle us with the knowledge and breaking down the game as, as we're going through. There's nobody better in the business to do that. So thank you once again for joining us. Appreciate you, Murph.